the right to be exempted from traditional age requirements for holding office. With life-threatening illnesses always knocking at the door, it was important to bring Marcellus into public life as quickly as possible, not just to give him the experience he would need if he was going to be an able governor, but to introduce him to the Roman people. Augustus made sure that the 21-year-old would be elected aedile for 23 BC. From this office, which you will recall was in charge of public games, Marcellus would be able to throw lavish festivities that were bound to make him extremely popular with the common man. With Augustus bankrolling everything, the games of Marcellus promised to be a spectacle. Augustus returned to Rome in 24 BC to oversee his nephew's emergence onto the public stage. But before he could preside over that happy event, he was treated to a tragic falling out with Messinus. At some point during the year, a plot against Augustus was either uncovered or invented, depending on who you talk to. And among those implicated was one of the consuls for the year, Aulus Terentius Varro Marina. Marina just so happened to be Messinus' brother-in-law, and when Messinus came home and discussed the uncovered plot with his wife, she quickly warned her brother to flee the city. When Augustus found out about the breach and trust, the relationship between the two men was altered forever. While Messinus continued to support the regime, he was out of the inner circle for good, a casualty of high-stakes politics. 23 BC would prove to be a watershed year for the empire. It was a year that showed just how quickly fate could wreak havoc on the carefully laid plans of men. Just as Marcellus was stepping into the office of Adile, Augustus became deathly ill. This time, his sickness was so bad that most everyone, including Augustus himself, did not believe he would survive. Consumed by what scholars now believe was typhoid fever, Augustus was faced with a difficult choice. He had planned for Marcellus to succeed him, but the young man was simply not experienced enough yet to take over. So Augustus turned to the man who had stood by his side all these years, who, though not technically a blood relative, was still his brother in all things, Marcus Agrippa. In Agrippa, Augustus could be sure he was leaving the empire in competent hands, a man who would rule wisely until Marcellus was ready to share in the burdens of state. Everything was arranged, and Agrippa was prepared to confidently step into the power vacuum his old friend was about to leave behind, when suddenly, due to some inventive treatment by his creative doctor, Augustus recovered. Over the course of the illness, though, it became apparent that the Senate was more than ready for Augustus to die and Agrippa to take over. Though he had tried mightily not to step on senatorial toes, Augustus couldn't help but secretly butt into provinces over which he had no authority. Even more emotionally important, though, Augustus's never-ending succession of consulships was creating a logjam of men vying for the year's one remaining slot. Men who were denied access to the high office year after year were becoming embittered, and when they visited him on his deathbed, he could see that they were ready for him to go. Octavian could now see plainly that the popularity of his regime was not what he had hoped it would be. It was time to amend the settlements of 27 BC. The first step he took was to resign the consulship on July the 1st, 23 BC, a day which would go down in history as the date Augustus himself marked the official beginning of his imperial reign. In return for this concession, he had arranged to be named Tribune in Perpetuity, an ingeniously simple maneuver that allowed him to abandon the consulship without actually giving up any power. A tribune, you will recall, has the right to attend senatorial sessions, propose legislation, and veto legislation. Is there really anything else that a despotic ruler needs to control the empire? Well, actually there is. While Augustus was supremely powerful in his own provinces, when it came to the senatorial provinces, or Italy itself, he was left awkwardly without any real legal authority. So he had the Senate award him what amounted to at-large proconsular authority. From here on out, whatever province he was in, Augustus would have the last word on everything. Having been granted all these prerogatives, however, prerogatives which would form the legal basis for the rest of his reign, Augustus was smart enough not to indulge in them. When it came to provincial administration, he usually deferred to the local governor, and when it came to legislation, he neither personally proposed many bills 
nor broke out the veto stamp very often. This was all possible because he had signaled behind the scenes how he wanted things to go, of course. But still, by avoiding public displays of power whenever possible, he left everyone feeling like they at least had some say in the matter. Sure, Augustus controls everything, but it's not like he's some crazy tyrant. The successors of Augustus would have done well to study exactly how Rome's first emperor managed to reign for over 40 years, while they were usually assassinated after just a few years at the helm. The final piece of the so-called Second Constitutional Settlement was the elevation of Agrippa to political heights almost as high as Augustus himself. It was clear that the Senate felt more comfortable with Agrippa holding some kind of formal power, and Augustus was obliged to agree. Granted similar at-large proconsular authority himself, Agrippa had now become something of a co-emperor. At this point, there is some disagreement over what happened next. What we know is that Agrippa left Rome and set up a base of operations on the island of Samos. What is unclear is why exactly he did so. In the account offered by Suetonius, Agrippa was sent into exile by Augustus because the latter was concerned his old general's growing power would interfere with his planned elevation of Marcellus. But by another account, Agrippa was sent east because he was the only one Augustus could really trust to look after his interests there. The role that Agrippa would subsequently play in the negotiations with the Parthians over the recovery of Crassus's lost legionary standards seems to point to the second reading. In the end, of course, whether or not Agrippa was getting in the way of Marcellus or not proved to be a moot point. At the end of 23 BC, with his successful year in the Aedile ship winding down, Marcellus became sick and suddenly died after a brief illness. This threw Augustus's plan into complete disarray and sent his sister Octavia into mourning for the rest of her life. Suddenly left without an acceptable heir, the status and rank of Agrippa now loomed large. As he had so many times before, Augustus turned to Messinus for advice. Messinus thought about the matter for a bit and then told Augustus, Well, you have made Agrippa so powerful that he now must either become your son-in-law or be killed. And that was how Agrippa officially joined the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 53, Reigning Supreme. Octavian had transformed himself into Caesar Augustus by skillfully using the mechanisms and rhetoric of the Republic to carve out an infallible little niche for himself, where Julius Caesar had made bold and inflammatory declarations about how obsolete Republican institutions were, Augustus was careful to never admit publicly what he was really up to. This was all about restoring the Republic, he would say. This is not about some personal power grab. It was all a charade, of course, but there was much to be gained by keeping the charade going. For example, not being stabbed to death on the floor of the Senate. But before we get going on the next few years of Augustan rule, I have to start this week by correcting what I said about the Pantheon last week. I'm not sure how exactly I managed to swing and miss so badly on my facts, but I did, so let's set things right. The Pantheon was indeed first built by Agrippa in 28 BC, and subsequently gutted by a fire in 80 AD. But when it was rebuilt in 126 AD, the construction was overseen by the Emperor Hadrian, not the Emperor Trajan, who had of course died in 117. And the blueprints were not set to Agrippa's original specifications, but rather new plans were drawn up that some have attributed to Hadrian himself, who was a big fan of architecture but most likely simply came from his staff architects who were engaged in multiple urban renewal projects initiated by the emperor. The dome, which is the Pantheon's most famous attribute, was a product of Hadrian's later Pantheon. Agrippa's original version did not feature this most famous architectural achievement. I completely misread and misinterpreted the source material when I was taking notes for last week's episode, and as a result, completely face-planted for about 40 seconds there. 
ugly business that I hope we can all put behind us. Okay, so by 23 BC, Augustus had worked out about 90% of the legalities for his long reign over the Roman Empire. There were still a few loose ends that needed to be cleared up over the next decade, though. Lepidus, for example, was still alive and serving as Pontifex Maximus, so Augustus was as of yet unable to assimilate that all-important religious position into his pile of honors. Plus, as much as his new proconsular imperium granted him preeminence in the provinces, Italy itself had always been treated differently under Roman law. So technically, Augustus had no right to command the 5,400 or so Praetorian guardsmen he had stationed in and around Rome. But other than those few outliers, Augustus was past the stage in his career where he was consolidating his power. Now, it was simply time to reign supreme. Ironically, one of the first early crises of his de facto dictatorship did not lead to pressure for him to abdicate the throne and revive the republic, but rather it led to pressure from the masses for him to set aside this de facto business and formally become dictator for life. The people had never been happy with the sloppy and corrupt oligarchy that had ruled them for centuries and saw no reason to mince words with the Senate now that Augustus was in charge. So, when a grain shortage rocked the city after Italian farms were crippled by plague, the common citizens rioted and called for Augustus to be named dictator. They had no faith that the Senate would be able to solve their problems. Only the princeps could see them through the trouble. But Augustus, knowing that publicly embracing absolute power would alienate the Senate, refused the honor. After telling the people that the abolition of the office of dictator, decreed by Mark Antony in the wake of Julius Caesar's assassination, was still in effect, and that he would rather be stabbed in the throat than assume that office, they were forced to relent. The incident highlights the counterintuitive notion that when it came to Augustus' relationship with common Romans, their problem with him was not that he had seized too much power, but that he had not seized enough. In the years after the constitutional settlement of 23 BC, Augustus focused his attention first on foreign affairs. He switched places with his co-regent Marcus Agrippa, sending his old friend into Spain to keep an eye on things in the west, while the princeps himself traveled to the east. His foremost concern was Roman relations with the Parthian Empire. Reviewing the disastrous campaigns of Crassus and Antony, Augustus determined that there was no productive angle in continuing to view Parthia as a territory right for imperial expansion. It was time to come to terms with the Parthians and embrace a new policy of mutual coexistence. But by no means had Augustus forgotten the legionary standards still displayed as trophies in the Parthian court. Any deal would have to begin with the return of Rome's lost honor. But it was not enough to simply say, give us back the standards and we'll leave you alone. After easily repelling two massive Roman invasions, the Parthians felt pretty good about their position. Plus, there was now a pro-Parthian monarch on the throne in Armenia. Unless the Romans somehow managed to regain control of Armenia, the Parthians really had nothing to worry about. So Augustus set about re-establishing control of Armenia. To lead the campaign into that all-important buffer state set for 20 BC, Augustus chose his 22-year-old stepson Tiberius. It was time for the young man to get his feet wet and introduce the world to an important new cog in Augustus' dynastic machine. But while Tiberius would ultimately prove to be a highly effective military commander, he didn't have much of a chance to prove it in Armenia this time around. While the legions marched to the border, a native revolt erupted that deposed the sitting monarch. All that was left for Tiberius to do was crown the hand-picked Roman successor. With Armenia back under Roman